So in connection with this day of Pentecost, you know, we're all here to celebrate this joyous festival that God wisely provided for our growth and for our continuing understanding of his great work that he's doing in us. I want to focus in this sermon today, on the day of Pentecost, on the true understanding of the Holy Spirit that we will read about here from the Bible. See, amazingly, we are blessed to have a true understanding of what the Holy Spirit is, how it should be viewed. You know, I'd like to begin here in John 14. John 14, verse 17, and I covered this in a sermon earlier, about the Holy Spirit being described as the Spirit of truth. And we certainly need to appreciate that fact. The Spirit of truth, that uh, is a description that Jesus gives directly of, of what the Holy Spirit is. But in verse 17, it amazingly gives a perspective that many uh, people who make up what I would call churchianity, Catholic or Protestant, or many brands of Protestant, that they must not read at all. Although I guess it probably has to do with how they look at themselves. But in verse 17, it says, even the spirit of truth, which the world is not going to receive, cannot receive because it doesn't see, and it should be correctly it, not him. It doesn't see it. It doesn't know it. Hey, what does that say? That says that the world does not. And see, you and I did not understand. We knew the words, the Holy Spirit, but we didn't understand it. We didn't receive it. We didn't know it. And it goes ahead to say, but you know it. And it dwells with you and will be in you. That's a pretty important verse to comprehend. You know, whenever you look at uh, commentaries and you look, you know, all the commentaries are written by some kind of a theologian or, you know, mostly Protestant, so I would say, although you do have a whole Catholic field of that. Uh, the topic of the Trinity the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that is not, I'll tell you, this is not what we're representing by our three strips up here. <laughs> we're not representing the Trinity. We, we understand that God the Father and Jesus his Son make up the Godhead. But the Holy Spirit is clearly an element that needs to be understood from the Bible. And yet, as I said about you know, what is commonly written about the Holy Spirit by people who don't receive or see or know what the Holy Spirit is, then it's about the most confusing concept in the whole religious world. An explanation is eventually described as so ununderstandable uh, well, you really just need to have faith. Have faith in whatever you know we say it is. And see, it's, it's not a third personage in a Godhead. But it does need to be understood clearly. And, of course, it's, uh, as it often is portrayed, and of course I think you find Pentecostal churches engaged in this you know, hyper-emotionalism of... Uh, Dealing with how you feel. Now, I'm pretty sure many of you were probably told whenever you were baptized, I certainly was over 55 years ago, you're not going to feel any different. 
You're not, nothing's going to happen that you would feel it whenever you're baptized and your minister asks God to give a gift of the Holy Spirit. You're not, that's not a, that's not a, I'm not going to fall down on the floor. I'm not going to fall backwards. I'm not going to, you know, all the crazy stuff that people do. See, misunderstanding of, you know, people can get a general idea of, even from the Word of God of, of the Father or of the Son, as they would eventually learn. Uh, but of the Holy Spirit, that, that's going to be completely confusing. And so what I want to focus on today is, uh, I, I hope, uh, reminding you of what you know. And clearly Jesus uh, began, became uh, the Son of God. He had existed with the Father prior to that time. Whenever he would come to the earth, he became the Son of God. He did that through a begettal. He was born into a physical womb in the womb, a uh, physical form in the womb of Mary. An unbelievably amazing, miraculous occurrence. And yet, it set a pattern. I say he became the Son of God through begettal, that the process of being born begins with being begotten and then growing and then finally being born, coming forth, being brought forth. And so it's important for us to know that. Let's look at this in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Verse 26, we see Gabriel coming to reveal to Mary what's going to happen. And of course, you know, what was going to happen was out of this world. It was extraordinary. It was, I'm sure to her, that this is impossible. And she knew that better than anyone. And yet Joseph would have to be pretty much convinced by the angel that came to him. I think it may have been Gabriel as well. At least Joseph was informed, you know, you go ahead and follow through on this. This is from God. Verse 26, the archangel was sent to the Virgin Mary. Verse 28 said, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Verse 30, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And verse 31, and now you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One will be called the Son of God in verse 35. You know, that had to be an amazing revelation that Mary would be involved with. And yet, I simply point out that it was true begettal. He would become a, a very unique son of God. He would be the only one that would fill the role of being Savior and Redeemer and coming King. He would be the only one. But see, it's through the process of begettal that others are added. That others are added to that family and understanding the Holy Spirit working in us. It's really very important. Let's look at John, John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is, of course, an important because it reveals that Jesus existed long before as the Word. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it's kind of almost repetitive. You know, it say, makes a statement, then says it again. He was in the beginning with God. And in verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. That was made. And so it again kind of repeats. And yet down in verse 14... It says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, 
the glory as of uh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And as you read that same statement in John 3.16, I covered that yesterday in Kansas City, how that, you know, yes, he was the unique, the unique and the only Son of God in that particular way. Now, we can become the children of God, the sons and daughters of God. We can be begotten of God, but we're not going to be Jesus. Jesus is always going to be a preeminent figure in our existence forever. And so we want to clearly understand that he is the unique Son of God who is full of grace and full of truth. He is the only one that fits that category. But let's jump up to verse 12. As many who received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but born of God. And so, clearly, you know, whenever you think about it, John 3.16 is an incredibly misleading verse to people who think, well, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. No, he's the only Son of God in that frame. See, that's a, a part of a, you know, just like we read earlier about the Holy Spirit referred to as a he. They have to refer to it as something. And if they think it's a personage, then they... You know, they assign it a, a, a male or a masculine uh, pronoun. And yet, uh, Jesus is the only, the unique Son of God. And yet the process of being the children of God is defined here in verse 12. You know, we will be born of God. We will be begotten with the Holy Spirit. And we will grow, and we will develop, and we will have to fly the plane. We will have to keep the plane in the sky. We will have to continue to rely on God to help us to be successful until we die. And then we will be brought forth in birth at the coming of Jesus. I think we may have heard about that yesterday. So, uh, I want to just point this out because the title of this sermon, Mr. Jackson, is The Father Engenders the Children. We have to realize that God, our Father, our Heavenly Father, is the one who, and this is taken directly out of some of our writing, God the Father generates or engenders us from above to establish a father-son or father-daughter relationship with us. It's very significant that we, we think about it in that way. Because, you know, he's doing that in a certain order. You know, it talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 about how he is doing things in an order. Christ being the first and then others, and then yet later even others. But the Father is the one who decides the timing, and the Father is the one who generates and of course, this is also true even regarding you know, things in our physical world, in our physical families. A mother you know, may wish to have children, but the father is going to have to be involved in providing that child. And it, it's amazing to think about that the father chooses when, and he chooses to generate or to engender the children. 
So there are three things that I want us to think about today. I'm going to have to very hurriedly go over them because I've spent way too much time up to this point uh, just pointing out that that's, that's what we want to be mindful of on this day of Pentecost. Yes, we are to be the first fruits, and yes, we're observing the Feast of Weeks, and it has something to do with the harvest, but it's the first of the harvest. And yet the Father is the one who is generating his children on schedule. He's the one who's doing that because he has, and this seems like an obvious statement, but I think is often maybe not thought of it. He has eternal life to give. There's no other way to get it. There is no other way to be generated, to have eternal life except through the Father and, of course, with the help of his son. So the first thing that I want to point out is, and, and it's important, I think, for us to understand this clearly, is that here in John 3, you know, we know the interaction that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus was a scholarly man. Uh, he was highly schooled and very high up in the society of, of the Jewish world and of the Jewish religion. And yet he could not just grasp who Jesus was, what he was going to say, what he was going to tell people. And so, you know, the whole topic of being born, as again the world looks at it, being born again, and of course it does say that, at least in many translations. And sometimes they translate it born anew, but the word that is used there are two words, born again. You know, they, they I think, are best understood uh, to recognize that the, we are born from above, because that's also a very legitimate way of understanding this. And... Again, the world completely misunderstands what born again is. See, again, it's not some kind of emotional feeling of, of guilt being gotten rid of and accepting Jesus into your heart, or you know, that you just feel like you have a need for religion. It's not some kind of dunking or confirmation. It has to be de dealing with being born a second time, and in this time, uh, being born of God. That is, that is what? From above. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 3. Said, Jesus says, Verily I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born. Your new King James, I think, says again. But it also can be translated from above. And that makes more sense to me because... That is, I mean, the, the word is also used in many other places to describe uh, from the top, from the highest. And, you know, it's, a, it's amazing. It's amazing to me in the book of James. I'll just give you these verses. You can look at them later if you want to read them. But in James 1, 17, it says, Every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights. And in verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 15, this wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly. He's making a contrast between what kind of wisdom you have in the world. In verse 17, chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and goes ahead to describe that. It's the same word that's translated again, born again in other places, but being born from above. Actually, we could look at John 3, verse 31. And John uh, the Baptist says in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist says, he who comes from above. Where had Jesus come from? He had come from the Father. He was directly a son of God, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth, but he who comes from heaven is above all. So, you know, it is from the Father. 
that you know we must be born again. Verse 5 of John 3, if we back up a little bit, Jesus says, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Now, sometimes that can be a little bit confusing in verse 5. What, what's the water and the spirit mean? And many times can read that and say, oh, I need to be born of the spirit somehow. They don't know what that is. But we do. You do. You know what it is that the Word of God says. That, well, you have to have a start. You have to have an earnest of the Spirit that's given. And then we have to develop and we have to grow. Because we realize that it's getting rid of our own old carnal nature. We're fighting it. And we're trying to keep the plane off the ground. But then, you know, we have to be conforming to the thinking of God. Our Father, we have to conform to the thinking of the Father who gave us the beginning of life and who is going to cause us to be born completely when Christ returns. And so water and spirit, uh, I've read two different things. I'm not sure exactly. You know, that could be referring, you know, just to physical as opposed to spiritual or Maybe it's referring to baptism. That, that was kind of a transition for all of us because you know, we were to die and then we were to rise in newness of life. And then the Spirit. But that also, it's beyond just the baptism, the forgiveness part. You know, we, need, we need to appreciate the work of the Holy Spirit. So he says in verse 7, Don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. And so it is with everyone who is born. See, being born from above is being born of the Spirit. And so it, it is important for us, important for us uh, to be mindful that as God has brought us into a process of being born from above, that He is the one who generated that through the Holy Spirit. We might turn over here to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse... Peter is actually talking about being begotten and later born of God here. It says in verse 21... Through him, talking about Jesus, through him belief in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So in verse 21 and verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. In verse 23, having been born Again, it could again be described as being born from above. Having been born from above, not of corruptible or perishable seed, but of incorruptible, imperishable seed through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. And this again points out that, you know, we want to be born again. And you know, we want to be born fully whenever Christ returns. And so the how God does that, how he causes a birth for the second time, as Nicodemus couldn't, he couldn't comprehend you know, what Jesus was saying. He actually really, I think, probably didn't want to give up his life that he had, even though he, could, he had to be a follower of Jesus, and I, he was around when he died, and he was wanting to help. He certainly seemed to be very sympathetic. But being born from above, knowing that it is the Father who engenders the children is important because the Holy Spirit, and this is a definition again that we use, the world does not use this definition, but the Holy Spirit is the essence of God through which he does incredible works 
of power. The Holy Spirit is the essence of God through which he does incredible works of power. That describes... See, now what kind of works of power does the Holy Spirit do? Well, it causes people to walk on the water, apparently with Jesus. It causes people to feed the thousands. Four or five, with only a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. It causes people to rise from the dead, as with Lazarus. It causes uh, other people to be healed. It actually rules over the wind and the waves. Those are all physical things that you could see in that, you know, the servants who saw the water-filled jugs of now wine, you know, they knew something had happened there. That was, that was a supernatural event. But that was a work of power from the Father. But again, maybe... And I, I would say it's very likely that the most incredible work of power from the Father is going to be transforming your carnal mind to be a divine mind, a divine nature. And that's through the work of the Holy Spirit. That Spirit is you know, so absolutely, incredibly important. And so that's the first thing that I need to mention here regarding the topic of the father engenders the children. Being born from above has a lot more meaning, a lot more significance, and I think benefit to me whenever I think about it. The second thing, this, these next two points, you know, you might find them a little unusual, uh, but, you know, I, I just thought of this as I was thinking you know, about the father engendering the children. He's the one who generates them. They become like him. They're, they are designed to become like him. They have, in a sense, in God's sense, God's DNA. We have God's abilities in, in a very limited form, as we, I think we feel. But see, the second thing, is, and this is some of you, I see you younger people here reading the Bible, and I would imagine all of us, maybe in the past, as we've tried to read the Bible, many of us, and I know certainly many people have tried to read the Bible. You know, they've started in Genesis, and now I'm going to read all the way through the Bible, and about chapter 4 or 5, you get to the begets the begets chapters. And if you really are in any, any consistent reading of that, you, you start getting completely confused, completely lost. You say, I don't have any idea who any of these people are. I don't know how they fit into the story. I'm you know, I don't know about Abel or Enoch or Noah or the you know really important ones there that are listed. And then, of course, you if you got through all of that and you went on, you got to Chronicles, and then you got the same stuff. And eventually, then you start reading the New Testament and you see this same stuff about Jesus because his genealogy is there. See, I call those the begets chapters, I guess, because it, it kind of ties in with the, what I'm pointing out, that the father begets the children. We could go to Genesis 5. I know this could take a long time, but I'll try to quickly do it. Genesis chapter 5. Why, why is this detailed in here like this in the Bible? Well, of course, understanding kind of the history of man, understanding the, you know, the connection from Adam all the way to Noah, Noah to 
Abraham and Abraham to the children of Israel. That helps us understand the whole Bible. And yet, people can start reading the Bible and just get so confused about chapter 4 or 5 of Genesis that they, they just quit. You know, because we, we, can't, we can't put this together. The chapter 5, in the book of genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man, verse 1, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years. He begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And so again, it was the father who engendered the child. There were many other children, Cain and Abel, and there would have to be other children of Adam and Eve if Cain and Abel had wives, or maybe not Abel, I don't know if it says, but Cain certainly did. They had to come from somewhere. And in verse 4, after he begot Seth, Adam lived 800 years and begot many sons and daughters. So the days that Adam lived were 130, or 930, and he died. And then Seth lived 105, and he begot Enosh. That's the whole pattern that you read throughout this chapter. You know, one father, one father, one father, a son that he begot. And you read that all the way through. And like I said, you can read Chronicles to begin with, the first few chapters in Chronicles 1. And, and there are other places that you can see this. Let's go ahead and take a look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, you see a similar pattern. Book of the genealogy. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so there are other things implied here. But in verse 2, Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah, and Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. You know, again, you can go down through the whole thing there. It's going to be showing how you know, the father begets the children. Now, there are other things that are revealed, other people involved, Rahab and Bathsheba, different of the women involved. But see, the focus is on the father and him begetting, engendering, generating the children. And so, you know, the process of begettal and then gestation, and then birth, is it's got to be understood when we understand what it is to be born of God. It is important to, I think, understand that in order to connect with what God is really doing with us. He has begun a good work in us. Donna, Philippians 1 6, her favorite verse. You know, God has begun a good work. It wasn't just you. It wasn't just, you know, you're such a good person. You you became a part of the church and you started to obey. No, the Father initiated that drawing and that calling. And no matter who you were around, whether it was a husband or wife, or whether it was parents, or maybe it was, you know, I guess it could have been others. It wasn't, wasn't that. It was the Father who was starting to work in a unique way to beget children. And the Father begets the children. Uh, Another thing I wanted to mention in connection with this here, the Bible seems to reveal, and it, it does clearly show, there are sons of God that are described in the Old Testament, maybe in the New, who are sons of God by creation. You know, the angels are described as sons of God by creation. God just created them. But 
the sons of God through begettal, through being generated and engendered by the Father, that allows us, uh, we should be incredibly thankful, even as in this country today and the United States, they're observing a national holiday of Father's Day. Children should respect and honor and thank their father. Obviously, we have a Mother's Day as well, but the focus is in the Bible here. If you read through all those, I, I had thought I would read through all of that, and then I'm thinking, that's going to take way too long because, you know, the pattern is clear. The father engenders, he begets the children. So that's the second thing. Being born from above is the first. Understanding the Father is the one who generates, begets the children. And then finally, the third thing. See, it's really amazing as you read in Genesis 1 how it is, and actually there, there are many books that are written. There was certainly a book that you know, we used as a textbook at Ambassador College, again, for me about 60 years ago, and I don't remember any of it. I saw the book the other day. I found it in my basement. I wasn't looking for it, but it's uh, called, the name of it is After It's Caught. It's a book that is debunking evolution, and yet it goes ahead and points out, and I didn't try to read through much of it because I knew what it says. You know, we find in Genesis chapter 1, the way that God created things, and we can go back to Genesis 1, and we'll quickly read through this. And I would say that the squirrel population on my street is doing this quite well because there were about, uh, I usually see one squirrel or two around the house. And of course, the rabbits are also the same and also the robins. They all reproduce after their kind. And like I said, there were, there were two squirrels that I thought, oh, you guys better get out of the way as I was trying to drive out. I mean, it's a half mile between my house and the main road. And before I got to the end, there were two others, and one of them was kind of small. I said, you don't know what you're doing. You, you're out here in the middle of the road, and you better get out of here. But, you know, that's what you find. Let's look in verse 11. Genesis 1, God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs, yielding seed and fruit trees according to its kind, whose seed is in itself and on the earth. You know, whenever you see all of the grass and the vegetation and the shrubs and the trees. You know, oak trees produce oak trees. The same way with all the other, and I can guarantee you, crabgrass produces crabgrass. You know, it, it keeps generating through that seed. Verse 12, the earth brought forth grass, herb yielding seed according to its kind, and the trees bring forth fruit whose seed is in itself, itself according to its kind. And then we drop down to verse 20. God says, let the waters abound with abundance of living creatures, let the birds fly above the earth. Verse 21, God created the great sea creatures, every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind. Whales reproduce whales. Fish. Catfish, I guess, reproduce catfish. Tuna, reproduce tuna. Salmon. Verse 21, God created the sea creatures, every living thing. The waters abounded according to their kind, and in every winged bird according to its kind. So, you now the robins, the, the uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was that I saw yesterday that flew right close to my car, he must have been a little disoriented, but he was just going up a creek, 
but it looked like a big egret or something. I don't normally see that around uh, our town, uh, but nonetheless, you see the pattern there. You jump down to verse, uh, say, 25, talking about the living creatures, the cattle, the creeping things, even the wild animals. Verse 25, God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And then, of course, you come to verse 26. Verse 26, the eternal God and the Word created man. God said, let us, the Father, the one who would be the eternal God and the eternal Word, that let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let us give them dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle, and the wild animals, every creeping, creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so in verse 27, God created man in his own image. And the image of God created in him, male and female. He created them. Uh, there's only two genders. Uh, there's not, I think I mentioned you know, having to fill out some forms where they gave me three options and another one gave me six options. Uh, I don't know where they came up with all that nonsense. Uh, but, I mean, some of them were, you know, just abhorrent. But male and female are the two options of genders. But it says, God bless them, said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. See, so who's kind? Everything is reproducing according to its kind. You know, God is reproducing in man his sons, his daughters, according to his kind, according to God's kind. And so that's why it's so fabulous. That's why it's so fabulous that we are in the process of being converted. We're not a finished product yet. But because of the work of the Holy Spirit, the essence of God through whom he does incredible works of power, he is reproducing himself. He wants us to grow and take on a divine nature that you can describe as the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and temperance. That, that's the nature that he wants us to have. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we need to grow toward. And whenever you read in Hebrews 2, in verse 10, it was fitting. Hebrews 2, verse 10, it was fitting for God for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, that he should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he and verse 11, Hebrews 2, verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, meaning all of one Father. All of one Father, because he is the one who begets and engenders the children. Both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And we go ahead and see that the Word the king is going to call us. I proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing praise to him. Again, I will put my trust in him. Again, here I am in the children whom God has given me. See, the amazing fact is that the Holy Spirit is not in understandable. It's not uh, a personage in a trinity at all. It actually is a gift. The gift of eternal life comes through the gift 
the begettle of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, God is the one who is beginning this good work in us. He begins this process of being born from above. And our job, of course, is to abide in the vine, in his word, in his love. And of course, we have to endure unto the end. We have to be consistent. Now we, we can get off the path at times. You know, we better come back. You know, we better wake up. We better get on the track of agreeing with God because that's what he wants for us. And as we endure unto the end, our lives and our breath is in the hand of God. You know, whether I live or whether I die, that's not up to me. That's up to God. He's the one who's going to either lengthen or shorten my life or anyone else for that matter. But we pray for the kingdom to come. We pray for Christ to return. And it's at that time when we'll either be resurrected if we've died or changed if we're still alive, that we can be brought forth in birth. We can actually then be born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit from God. The children who are born after God's kind. We will be able to see and enter and inherit because we are joint heirs with Christ, we're going to be able to enter the kingdom, the rule of God. And we usually think of that as a time frame, as a millennium, but the kingdom of God is far more than just that because it encompasses the entirety of the plan. And so we can inherit the kingdom and be allowed to be the glorified children of God who have received the gift of eternal life from the Father because the Father engenders the children and the Father and the Word with Him have eternal life to give us. So I hope in our thinking about the day of Pentecost, it's not just as we read in Genesis, or, uh, Acts 2, you know, the pouring out initially of the beginning of the church, the beginning of the, you know, the New Testament church as we know it. You know, that's what it describes. And of course, that, that was poured out in power. It was poured out in a manifestation that was quite visible. Uh, but today, you know, all of us have been begotten of God. All of us are in a gestational stage and all of us, Await, await the time when we would be brought forth in birth. And at that point, you know, we can actually be given uh, eternal life. See, it's easy to read, you know, that the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm sure many people could quote that. You all probably could. And there are probably a lot of people who would know what James Romans 6.23 says. They're not understanding what having eternal life is. Life that has been generated by the Father through the essence of God, the Holy Spirit that He has given us. So we have an incredible need to be thankful to our Father. Not only for this physical life and existence, but for the Spirit life that he holds out before us.